know most of us have already heard Rabbi Mendeleev speak once, twice, even three times on Shabbat. And we know what an engaging and powerful speaker he is. The reason the Meaningful Tefillah Project invited him to speak again today is this. We stand in awe of the rabbi's ability, having grown up in a completely secular environment, to connect to the Jewish people, to traditional Judaism, and to Hashem through prayer in the midst of terrible conditions, in labor camps, in prison in the Gulag, during a hunger strike. During all these experiences, he repeatedly found Hashem's hand in his daily life and prayed with fervor. What does that say about us? Why do we today in America, living a life of material abundance and complete freedom, frequently have difficulty focusing our prayer, connecting with Hashem, and developing a sense of spirituality? <coughs> Are our lives too good to need God? We have asked Rabbi Nalevich to help us learn from his heroic story of faith in Soviet Russia how to improve our own kavanah in the material paradise that is America. After his remarks, he will answer questions from the floor and then autograph copies of his book for those who have not had a chance to get them yet and additional other books if we run out of his autobiography. Thank you all for coming this morning. Please welcome Rabbi Nalevich. Thank you for coming. I didn't expect to have to be proud Sunday morning. Um, I promised yesterday evening to tell you the happy end, but I will uh, start with a bad beginning to come to the happy end. And um, I'm sorry that uh, some of you were not in the, uh, during uh, Shabbos, so you don't know the whole story. You will read it in the book. Uh, as uh, my host and friend Stuart mentioned, there's a long way to go from a uh, secular Soviet uh, youngster to become uh, a believer, an observing Jew, and not only an observing Jew, but uh, a fighter. People, part of uh, people that fought for the freedom of Soviet Jewry. And it's a real, real miracle in my uh, way, in my understanding. Mm -hmm. I can't explain you how it really happened, but I will give you some uh, small stories, and uh, you will uh, imagine what it's about. And then uh, Stuart mentioned that, if I am not mistaken, that like I can instruct you to have a real kabone. <laughs> I cannot. But at least, again, learn from my stories and make your conclusions. So it happened uh, when, um, when I was a child, uh, age 10, my father was arrested by the Soviets uh, for uh, nothing, almost for nothing. And it was a real tragedy. You can imagine that the police breaking in your home, torching, yelling, and uh, taking your father away. We all cried. We couldn't believe. For that time, we trusted the Soviet regime. We trusted that it is good. And all of a sudden, it uh, treated my father that badly. So we understood uh, that uh, he'll be sentenced. Then uh, the time of the trial came. We were not permitted to enter the building of uh, the court. So imagine winter and uh, across the big uh, building of the court, a <coughs> family of uh, my, my mother and three children, my two sisters and me standing. It was a real tragedy. And uh, all of a sudden I felt that I can do something for my father. What a child can do to help <coughs> his father. So I start telling something like that, saying, please, please, help my father out from the prison. And then I told, I promise you that I will be a good boy, I will behave. And then I asked him, who am I talking to? Now I understand that it was my first experience in prayer. I discovered myself that there is some, somebody that you can ask and you can trust and you can hope that he will help. But that time I got afraid. Why am I talking to you? I stopped it. 
but see the memory was and uh, experience was that strong that I uh, saved it with, with me. It was an outcry of a child and as a matter of fact, really telling to everybody, uh, our soul is praying all the time. Doesn't depend on us. See, nobody, nobody instructed me, nobody educated that there is a Rebbeinu Olam that you can ask him and pray, and it is my Jewish soul that discovered me. So it's like my own experience that it is true that every Jew it doesn't depend if it's uh, uh, teach, taught, learn, prayer or just going from our soul, every moment a Yiddish and Ishoma, a Jewish soul is praying, is in constant contact with Rebona Shalom, and it's uh, our duty to discover it and to strengthen the feeling, to strengthen the tie. <coughs> so after that, uh, it was bad. My father was sentenced to five years of imprisonment, and uh, my mother couldn't withstand that. She passed away, and so we remained alone. I remember the day of her funeral in the cemetery, for the first time I heard the Kaddish, is Gadavi, is Kaddash, Shmei Rabo. And it made a, such deep impression, it was something like a, you know, really sacred song. It is how I started uh, loving Loshan Koitesh. I felt that the day will come, I'll be able to speak the language. You know, my connection with Hebrew, Loshan Koitesh, is through Kaddish. And uh, sorry to say, many things happened in my life and I needed to tell it again and again. But it was uh, the first, for it sounded you know, like mystery. I couldn't understand the words, but it was like a song, not like a prayer, mostly as a song. Again, prayer, <coughs> connection to Ribboni Shalulam. Later on, after my father was released, I was a youngster of 16, and I decided uh, to support my father after the prison was ill, he couldn't work, so I went uh, to work in a factory, and uh, it was another miracle. We say uh, on Elul, specifically before uh, Rosh Hashanah, there is a <coughs> saying that uh, bad things can be turned to be good. It depends on you. And it's how it happened. Also, the reason for me going to this uh, factory was bad, the death of my mother, the rest of the father, but the consequences were good. <coughs> For after uh, working in a factory, up to 5 p.m., we would go to study in a school. For every, everybody dreamt to become an engineer, a doctor. So, uh, and it was special. It was really a schus to study in this uh, school for it turned to be populated heavily with uh, Jewish youngsters. Mostly, I am from Riga, it has some maybe 9,000 or you know, a million of uh, citizens, and there are some 30,000 Jews inside, so statistically, how you can uh, uh, meet a Jew? But in my case, all Jewish youngsters come specifically to study in this evening school, and we met. And it created a different, a, a altogether different atmosphere. For um, when we talked, each to other, we understood that we hate the country, and each of us dreams to go to his uh, homeland, Curtis Royal. And then something else happened. Uh, one day, a friend of mine, during the break in his in, in studies, announced to other friends in the classroom, also it was a Soviet, uh, uh, Soviet institution, this, uh, this school, but he was not afraid, and he told friends, we, wouldn't, we will not uh, uh, study today. What's the reason? Today is a new year. I thought, what a new year, it's October. 
It doesn't matter that Jews knew here. You know, <coughs> you imagine how ignorant I was. I thought, what? The Jews have a different New Year than others. I felt bad. I felt bad about that. You know, I felt bad being Jewish at all. I dreamt maybe to be became Russian, and all of a sudden, it turned out that even a New Year is uh, like not like others. So what to do? The friend that maybe was more involved than me told them, all of us have to go to the synagogue. Me, a, a modern man, to go to a synagogue, you know. I dream to be a scientist. What has to do religion with, uh, with science? But uh, I had no way to do for all my friends uh, went to the synagogue. I followed them, felt bad. But uh, it happened that we wouldn't enter the, the building. We stayed outside. And it was the reason of them going there. For we met more friends, other people from uh, different uh, areas of the city come together. And it was a beautiful feeling. You say Rosh Hashanah is an important, uh, 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 important day. For us, for us, it became a place of meetings, you know. Just to meet a Jew, I'm Israel Chai, you know. To discover that I'm not alone, that there are other people, boys and girls, so I asked uh, friends what, uh, when they will, uh, the Jews will have another holiday. So I imagine what they told me another 10 days, nine days they will have another holiday. Say, it's not a holiday at all, Yom Kippur. But for me it was another reason to come to the synagogue to meet my friends and make more friends. And I felt good, you know. It's a provision. It is, it, it is what we say, Ashgoche, you know. If somebody would uh, uh, logically explain me that I, that I am a Jew and I have to go to the synagogue, in no way. But it happened without my will. But the moment I entered uh, the, the yard of the synagogue and the street outside, you know, sometimes you have to enter uh, for the premises inside, uh, inside the, the building and you look around, it's not uh, something special, you know, normal. I was afraid to enter. But I was already entered inside, inside uh, the synagogue. I saw people like my father, nothing uh, special. And then a friend of mine told, uh, come in a week, there will be another holiday, Sukkot. I thought, it's a beautiful religion, you know. Every week they have another holiday. <laughs> it is how I became connected with, uh, with uh, Judaism. Again, if I, I had to make a decision, I don't believe it will happen, would happen. But it happened without my decision, and I was there, and the moment I was there, I invited other friends. I told, come to the synagogue, you know, you will make friends. And the moment you are in the synagogue, you are listening to Kaddish, and you're listening to Shmonaisre, and it's how, step by step, I got involved, involved in everything. And then uh, there was uh, another a very important development. Another friend uh, announced during the studies in a school, he told friends, next uh, Sunday, uh, all Jewish youth will uh, come together on a Jewish cemetery to rebuild, reconstruct the Jewish cemetery. So, you know, we were grown people, you know, and some people would say, what? To use my Sunday there had no week or weekends. It was the only holiday, free day Sunday. To use my Sunday to go to a cemetery, you know, what I am crazy, you know. I got a ticket to go with my girlfriend to, uh, to see a new movie. So what, you know, what about the cemetery? And then somebody would say, we have tests on the way. We have to study to prepare ourselves. And I felt that I have to go. For I thought to myself, what? There's a Jewish place, and more Jews will come, and we, we shall do something for Am Yisrael. It, it was, for me, much more important than to go to uh, see a movie, and even uh, more important than uh, to study for, for the exams. So uh, when uh, I arrived uh, to the spot, a friend told that it is outside Riga. I am from Latvia, Riga. Uh, outside Riga, I stopped out from the bus. I looked around. There was no cemetery. It was uh, like a, a, a Latvian village. And uh, there's a, a, like a field and a forest. No cemetery at all. I felt bad. I got angry. I told I come back, I will beat him. For he, you know, used my time, my Sunday for nothing. So going back to the stop, I looked around, and all of a sudden, 
I saw among the trees in the forest some people. I looked closely. I saw they are dressed differently than the villagers. So I felt uh, Jewish. It's the people that I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. And I start running <coughs> through the field mm -hmm. and like feeling like Ruach HaKodesh is telling me yourself, now it is a new page in your life. Mm -hmm. Entering the forest, I saw Jews, and you know how in uh, Golas we enjoy meeting uh, uh, fellow Jews, I, I would say, the same nose like mine, the same eyes like me. And you know that it happened that my name is Yosef. Once Yosef met his brother and they sold him. Now it was a tikkun. I met my brother and uh, I was glad. It was good, but there was one problem. Where's uh, the cemetery? There was not, not cemetery around, only a forest. Uh, there were like um, a lot of uh, sand, like a pail of sand, and they put, people would uh, take it with their hands and uh, put in some baskets, whatever, the boxes, and move it to another place to spill it down, but there was no um, cemetery around. I was ashamed to ask the people what they are doing specifically, for I understood that they know. But then, after a while, I looked uh, at the place that they will, would spill down the sand, and I saw it's like a, a grave. It's like a trench, a long trench, and there were bones inside. So I understood what the cemetery. It was a place of a massacre when, uh, in 1941, uh, Latvians uh, killed some 30,000 Jews of uh, Riga. In, in, the, in the field. The field was full with bones, with um, uh, killed people, and uh, for more than 25 years, the Soviet uh, authority wouldn't take care of it. So I asked myself why they wouldn't uh, build a memorial or something <coughs> like that, for in fact, they fought against the Nazis, and they can be, could be proud, you know, telling it is what the Nazis did, and we, uh, the Soviet army, saved that much that it was possible to save. And then I understood that if they erect a memorial, people would come, say Kaddish, El Mole Lachemim, Iskor, remember, they will remember. And it is exactly what uh, the authorities would like to us to make, for they would like to us to forget that we are Jewish. And Iskor means remember. So the moment I came to take care on the grave of the Holocaust, I became an opponent of uh, the Soviet regime. For they would like me to forget, and I would like to remember. You don't need too much to be um, an uh, enemy of Soviet Union. Just remember, be Jewish, and you became uh, dangerous. So other people would come, uh, knowing uh, that there's something going on, and I watched them coming. They're older than me, more experienced. They looked around and they asked uh, the people that already were involved in these uh, activities, Tell, say please, do you have uh, permission from the authorities? And the people told them, no. what kind of permission do you need? Listen, what does it mean that they, they don't have a permission? So the people would say, or you don't understand. We have jobs, we have positions, our children are studying, we are not going to lose everything because of uh, dealing with uh, dead people, you know. So it's like um, a dilemma, you know. Me, I'm a simple student, without thinking anything, I felt dead people killed by Nazis, I have to take care of them. But other people were more sophisticated, more clever, and they understood that they have to make the decision between death and life. And they decided, they felt that time they, they decided life, and they lost the dead people. So it was uh, my first mitzvah that I performed my, by my hands, as you know, you know met mitzvah. The, the halacha says that if you found on the way a Jew dead, you have to, look, to stop everything and take care of him. So my privilege is the first mitzvah that I made, it was uh, the biggest and the most important mitzvah of uh, Met Mitzvah. So next uh, uh, time uh, I told my friends, 
that it's uh, truly very needed and it is important and everybody has to go and come, people start coming and I uh, go, uh, uh, father, three years later, I already entered, I entered the university, studied there and um, there were hundreds of young people there on the graves. There was a stop in our working and they start singing. I thought there's something bad, you know, the Goyama singing on the, on, on the graves. We just don't sing on the graves. And then I listened what they would sing. They would sing, I'm Israel High. David Melech Israel High Bikayam. So I thought to myself, maybe it's good. I thought to myself, maybe the dead people are listening to our, our young voices and they enjoy it. For the moment they were killed and pushed in the grave, they felt everything is lost. And now after 25 years, they are hearing our young voices singing Am Yisrael Chai. And then I asked myself, do the dead people hear? You know, it is a crucial issue. Hamitim uh, Chayim is discussed in uh, Sanhedrin. It's, uh, to believe in uh, uh, resurrection, that the dead people has in their soul. And I hesitated for a while, for I was not uh, learned to, to know that the dead people are, will be alive and that their soul is there. And they thought certainly they know and they enjoy. So it is how I discovered it, the most important, the most uh, difficult issue of Tchia uh, Samesi. And then later on, uh, after half a year, I had like a gathering there on Yom HaShoah Agura. Older people uh, arranged a whole manifestation. I believe it was the first illegal manifestation in Soviet Russia that maybe a thousand of Jews come in the forest. Police was there, but they couldn't prevent anything. And people did say Kaddish and did say El Rachami and did say Iskor. We won the battle. And then uh, people talk, and I had the privilege to speak out on behalf of a young generation, and I told friends, see what a miracle happened to us. We came to the dead people to help them. We collected the bones, pieces of clothes, to bring them to Cambridge Royal. Now I told, we understand that it was us. We were dry bones, not them. And thanks to the dead people, we felt that we are alive. They taught us that we have to be alive, that we have to, to be strong, that we have to continue. It's really, as we said, the prophecy of Yeheskel Anovi, that we, as a dry bones, ignorant Russian Soviet students, come to take care of dead people, and they taught us that we are Jewish, and we have a destiny, we have a challenge. And I told, listen, what the dead people are telling us. They tell us, they say us, never stay anymore in this coarse place, Lech Lecha. <coughs> it is how I started my uh, Jewish uh, awareness. And then I met uh, my friends that uh, we worked together in the evening, and I suggested to establish an underground Jewish student organization to teach uh, my people being Jewish. To be being proud that you are Jewish, to, to teach Hebrew, teach history and uh, Jewish uh, uh, heritage, etc. So, see, out from the graves, we started a new life. You know, it means that uh, you cannot kill a Jew. The, the energy, the spirit is all there. And when I'm telling you the story, I feel that I myself came out from the grave. They would like to kill me, and I am alive. And I am ready to struggle, and I am ready to fight. So you, now you can understand somebody that told my story about the being arrested and uh, in the airport, trying to hijack an airplane. And people, people would ask me, why are you not afraid? I am not afraid, for they killed me already, and I am alive. I am not afraid of this anymore. So. Uh, and then the time came, I described you when I approached uh, the office, uh, so-called uh, office of uh, granting permission to leave, asking for permission to leave, and uh, it was obvious that uh, I would be refused. 
for uh, they would say what you're willing uh, to leave our country it means that you don't sympathize us you are an enemy if you are enemy how at all you study in our university i studied in their university how you're taking position so most of the people were afraid to identify themselves it would sit back also i be believe at least in riga the majority would like to leave but nobody was a, 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 was uh, enough uh, courageous to pronounce it. So I went and I told that I would like to leave. And uh, then, you know, when he told me, forget about it, you know, you can accomplish your studies in the university and you will build us our country, Russia, never you see Israel. I decided I will start my studies in the university. What I need to be uh, helpful for the Soviets, I don't need uh, their education. I, will, I would better to be uh, a simple worker, but uh, not to build a communism. So uh, uh, I was not aware of something very important. Uh, until I studied in university, they wouldn't uh, draft me to the army. The moment I, was, I dropped out from the university, I got summon, summoned to uh, serve the Soviet army. So a day that I had to go to the office of, uh, of the drafting uh, station, I, I, I can't sleep, I couldn't sleep. I told to myself, what will happen if they draft me to a, a Russian army, I forget about Israel for certain. No, you know, sometimes uh, you are too extreme and you believe that it's the best and finally it turned out that it's counterproductive. Uh, maybe I had to continue to study now, as uh, the moment I, I will, would be drafted to Russian army, they would uh, tell that I have an uh, approach to their military secrets, never really would permit me to live, to, uh, to, to go out. So I felt that I have to, to do something, like I have to sacrifice something. What sacrifice? And then I had an idea. Up to that time, I would go to a synagogue, I got some knowledge in Jewish heritage, but uh, I was not an observant Jew. And I told to myself, you said, you teaching other Jewish heritage, Jewish history, you tell people go to Israel. What's the reason to go to Israel? The main reason is going back to your roots, to Abraham, Isaac, Yaakov, to be like them. So you teach others, what about you? I told, what to become an observant Jew or religious, you know? I, I can't afford it, you know, it is not comfortable. Ah, oh, it is not comfortable for you, so sacrifice your comfort. And I understood that it is, uh, uh, it is uh, the, the decision that I have to make, and I told Ibn Shalulam, if you save me from Soviet army, I will be yours. So, next day I went uh, to the drafting station, it was the first interview, so the officer opened my folio and he saw that I studied in university. So normally he asked, what's the reason you drop out from the university? What I would tell him that I'm willing to go to Israel or that I hate the Soviet power, I can do it, you know. What, what to tell him? Well, I looked around and all of a sudden I saw in the back of the officer, in a window, a small bird on a tree. And I understood that the Rebona Shalom is already helping me. So I told officer, you see the bird? It is free. Now it is here, in the most moment, it can go whatever it would like to go, not me. I thought I was born here, and I accomplished my studies in high school, and then I am finishing my studies <coughs> in university. Everything already, already said. Also, I didn't make any decision, like everything is said in my life. So he told me, what, you would like uh, to be like a bird? Yes, I told certainly. So they sent me to a mental institution. Imagine <laughs> to have a soldier that needs to be a bird. <laughs> it was not that pleasant to be there. Uh, I was afraid of the, uh, you know, of the people there. So I sat in the corner and I decided that I will not uh, pretend being insane. I am a normal man, I will behave uh, like everybody for, I don't know, you know, I'm not a, a psychiatrician, I don't know what the symptoms for, of, of the illness. But only one question that they would ask, I would answer positively. They would ask me, you, do you feel 
that uh, you are being watched, that somebody is watching you. I thought for sure, you know, we are we are ma members of underground movement, movement, so we were. We found that uh, somebody KGB or police are watching us. So finally, after a month, he told uh, that there was a medical commission, and they told me, "See, a young man, uh, we are sorry to admit, but uh, you are not eligible to serve in the army." You have to stay here in a hospital, and we shall treat you, and everything will be okay. So I got afraid that they will keep me there in the mental institution. I told, no, I am healthy. I am willing to serve in Soviet Army. I, I was not aware that it's the best symptom that you are mentally <laughs> have mental problems if you say that you are healthy. You know, say, okay, we understand everything. You are free. So the gates open, and imagine where I would go directly to the synagogue, where the Bonish Olam kept his uh, part, you know, took me out from the, from the Soviet army, so I have to pay my part. I went to the synagogue, met the uh, old people, and I, I told them, help me became uh, religious, teach me Yiddish kind. And that time, you know, it was illegal. According to Soviet law, it was uh, illegal to teach Yiddish kind, and they told, no, in no way, we are not permitted to do. You see the irony. A young man is willing uh, to, to learn to become a, a real Jew, and uh, there is no way to teach. I believe that they felt, you know, something strange in me. A young man, you know, in my age, never would come uh, to a synagogue to ask to teach him be, being religious. And uh, certainly they believe that I, I'm from a mental institution, which was true, <laughs> but for a good reason. So, Anyway, I stayed there for that time. Our, I, I already became a Hebrew teacher. I did know some Hebrew, so I, I understood the prayers. And specifically, it sounded again and again Kaddish for me. I remember it by memory Kaddish. I started trying to memorize Shmona Esrei. I became a part of it. But then, you know, I was an activist. We had meetings, discussions, involved uh, new, new friends in our movement. So step by step, I left it somehow. But still my friends believe that I am religious. They would say, what say on Yom Kippur? You fast, you don't eat anything. I thought, obviously, it's uh, forbidden. On Pesach, you eat only matzah. I thought, sure, sure, I said, we can't eat anything else. I would say, no, it's, uh, you know, too, uh, too extreme, you know. We honor Jewish heritage, but not to this extent, you know, they believe that I am a fanatic, but I didn't know, I did know better that I have to accomplish a lot to be a really, really a religious Jew. And then, as I told you yesterday, the time, the time came that I had to make this decision, being arrested in a prison, it was really something special that um, it was a struggle between life and death. And in fact, there in a, in a prison, they promised me that if I behave like them and stop being Jewish, it will save my life. I never had a problem of, uh, of this. For I hated to be a Soviet citizen. I did remember my life as a Soviet st a student without any uh, knowledge of being Jewish. It was a dull life. And the moment I discovered what the meaning to be a Jew, it was the best thing that I got in my life. I understood that it's a benefit, a real privilege being Jewish. And it's a real life. Without being uh, Jewish, behaving like them, it is not life for me. So I start my struggle, and I discovered, I will not repeat it again. I uh, felt that if I behave Jewish in the cell and demonstrate them that I am Jewish, it will save me as a Jew. I never considered it will save my life or not. I understood that the only way to keep me strong is behave Jewish. And finally, they had to admit that even in a prison, you can be a ben Horin. For what means uh, to be a ben Horin, a free man? You are doing in a, every place whatever you like to do, right? It's uh, freedom. I like being Jewish. And like being Jewish and try to be Jewish even in a prison. And as we say, here is a free country indeed, it is true, but even in the free countries that are outside the prison are slaves, you know. So it doesn't depend in what condition you are. It depends what makes uh, 
make you feel happy. Me, feel happy is uh, being Jewish. And then being sent uh, after getting this uh, 12 years penalty, I was sent to the prison and uh, I had to try to keep mitzvahs there, which was not uh, easy. I told you yesterday a story that um, uh, we managed to uh, bribe a certain guard and he smuggled inside the sidur. Now I'll bring you more details of the sidur. Uh, when I come back from the factory, it means not I privately come back, the whole hundreds of, uh, of prisoners were sent to sleep in the barracks and in the morning I had, had to get up and go back to the factory. I was told that uh, this uh, supervisor that got money for that put a cedar under my mattress. So I entered uh, the barrack, lifted the mattress, and I saw a beautiful cedar. You know, I dreamt to have it, but I couldn't have it. For uh, it was a uh, board on two floors, on a, up, up to me was a uh, former Russian policeman with the Nazis. And certainly he would inform that I have a strange book, for it was that good that the uh, Soviet, Soviets would never print a, a beautiful book like that. So it's like to be and not to be, to have and not to have. What to do? I decided I will go to work at night and coming back in the morning, the barrack was almost as empty and I could use the sidur for all uh, the prisoners were sent to work in the factory. It was hard not to sleep at night, but at least I had the privilege of doubling and then I got another idea. What if I copy down uh, the scissor in uh, small pieces of paper? For as a matter of fact, I continued to study Hebrew uh, in a prison on uh, small cards, like writing from one side a uh, Hebrew meaning and from another side Russian meaning. So I decided to produce my prayer, uh, my scissor in, uh, uh, in uh, like a, a matchbox. And I brought you here an example uh, how it looked like. Just it is not a real one for everything when I was released was uh, confiscated. It's a simple, where is it? Oh, yeah, it's it. Like a simple matchbox. And inside you have the hot filler. Mm -hmm. So you can, I could stand even uh, during a uh, day uh, having my filler and davening. And the moment the guards would enter, I could put it in my pocket, so it was uh, safe. And then I decided to repeat and make another copy of my sidru and put it under the ground. In a moment, if they would discover and confiscate my sidru, I will be able to use the second one. And the moment I finished uh, my copying the sidru, all of a sudden I happened, I, I felt that a miracle happened to me. I got it on my memory. You know, you young people know it from your childhood. I was at that time 25, year, 25 years old, nobody taught me. And then the miracle happened. I did remember everything by memory. At least, Shachris Min Hamayri. So imagine, uh, I felt that there is really another dimension of freedom. For being in a punishment room, they take away all your belongings and staying there day after day, week after week, you can get crazy without not doing anything. But I did have to do. I had my feeling. So I would come up in the morning, and normally, how much we, it take for us shakhlis? Like 45 minutes, more. For me, it would be three hours. For I enjoyed start telling Peter Maktore, Carbones, word by word, and telling, and you know, feeling, Oi, Abraham Avinu, Isaac Avinu, David Amelech, like escaping the prison. It was my life in a, in a feeling. It was a real life, just in a feeling. For outside, it was a wrong life. And then I tried to, uh, to continue as much as I could for three hours. And by the way, sometimes, uh, Dominic, uh, telling, the words of that filler, I had a certain idea. So I stopped, I would stop and think about that and then come back and continue. So uh, after three hours still finished, I am back 
to my slavery, but the next will be Mincha on Mari. So it was a real achievement to memorize and to remember my tefillah. And then there was another problem. Uh, also, now I did remember everything by memory, but in the morning it was Im almost impossible to dump inside the barrack. You can imagine barrack filled with tons of uh, prisoners, is uh, stinking there inside, and uh, it's uh, uh, night, uh, you, you're not permitted to move out from the barrack, except of going out to the facilities. They built a facility outside the barracks, some maybe 25 meters out, so I used it, used it. in the morning I would walk up before uh, uh, general, uh, uh, general uh, coming up, uh, for we are not permitted, as I mentioned, to get up earlier, uh, like 6 o'clock, everybody has to go up and go to the, uh, to the factory, so I would come uh, earlier, and uh, mostly in Siberia is a lot of snow, so I would dig a shelter in the snow on the way to, um, to the laboratory and stand in the snow, davening. And the moment I had, I would hear uh, uh, guards coming up. I would immediately step out and go uh, like to, uh, to the laboratory. But once an officer uh, uh, caught me and they told me, hey, what are you doing here in the snow? I don't know, I'm going uh, to the facilities. No, he told me, you will never cheat me, you know. I know that you, are, you did something against our power, you know. I don't know exactly what it's about, but the next time I found you here in the snow, I will punish that for, you for that. Certainly, uh, Tvila was the uh, mo most powerful weapon against uh, the Soviet regime. So, and I describe you how I managed uh, later on uh, get uh, my Sidur inside the prison, uh, gluing down a page of a Russian book like it should like uh, the Sidur was published not in Russia, but and we had we were permitted to have only books published in Soviet Russia. So I produced uh, gluing down a, a page, a first page of a Russian book inside my Sidur. So it's how I could continue to daven even in a, in a prison and teach others. So step by step. As I told you, uh, it developed until I come uh, to this uh, um, prolonged hunger strike. And I explained to you and described to you yesterday how important it was for me, like uh, when I started the 40th day of hunger strike, I felt that elevated, that uh, I felt that I like, like Moshe Rabbeinu. And I felt myself that close to Rebun Shulam for I am fasting, I am teaching other Jews Torah, you know, what uh, can be more important in, in your life. To eat food, not, not that important, but to know that you are doing something for your nation, and you are helping other people, and you are true to all the behest, it was uh, the biggest enjoy. And finally, because of my prayer, we won, and I got everything back. Not only me, I know that people, you know, there were in here in America were people that would say only Tilim and other people would demonstrate. It came together and the Soviets gave up. So finally, when uh, I was released from the punishment room uh, after uh, 57 days of uh, my hunger strike, I described you how I prayed, I made this uh, Hanukkiah from piece of bread and some thread of linen, and I told Rebona Shalalama, I know it's in uh, Gemora, Eretz Israel, nicknamed the Yisurim, maybe I deserve already to be in Eretz Israel. So I was taken away, brought to a uh, central prison of KGB, and then I was, after two weeks of uh, uh, ex expectation, what will happen, maybe they will um, make another trial and uh, sentence me to another imprisonment for giving away the knowledge of me being a hunger strike to uh, human rights, UN Human Rights Commission. So I described you when I entered the room, there were two men, uh, two Russian colonels, and uh, somebody in plain clothes, he took a piece of paper and he told, I announce you that according 
the degree of uh, 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 Soviet, of the uh, high Soviet, uh, you are being uh, um, uh, fired from Soviet Russia. You don't deserve anymore to be a Russian citizen. It took for them 11 years to decide that I don't fit their criteria. So when he announced it to me, I told uh, Baruch Hashem, Baruch Shmo. Uh, so the officer asked me what you are telling there. I told them, it's a mitzvah. We are obliged to thank God for the uh, miracle that he produced here on the spot. And then the officer told me, what? You know, I remember he told me when I announced to a famous Russian uh, uh, writer, Solzhenitsyn, that he is being fired out from Soviet Russia, he cried on my shoulder. And you being sent away from your Russian motherland, you enjoy it. I told, what the difference is that Solzhenitsyn, Solzhenitsyn homeland is Russia. So you sent him out, it was bad for him. And you are sending me to my homeland, why should I cry? And then the man told, okay, we know you can, you can explain everything. Take, uh, take him away. So now I got a beautiful shower and I remember that it was exactly what happened with my uh, predecessor, Yosef Atzadi, that the moment he became free, you know, he was well dressed. As there is a, in the book, you can see me being already in uh, Ben Gurion Airport with a beautiful black suit, Pierre Cordel from France. I used it later for Chavez. And they went, bought me a hat, put me in a big uh, black car, and uh, going directly from the prison to uh, the airport, a colonel that escorted me told me, see, we are giving you honor like you are a president. For I was escorted by police on motorbikes from all sides, like directly to, uh, uh, and I felt that I deserve it, for I'm uh, the grand-grandson of Yosef that was the prime minister of Egypt, so I have some schools as well. So coming, um, coming uh, to the airport, before uh, getting up uh, to the airplane, I talked to the colonel, for I figured that he may be like a head of a Jewish department in KGB. And I told him, see, you arrested us 11 years ago to prevent us to go uh, from Soviet, out from Soviet Russia. And now I was aware that at that time, all the 300,000 Jews got permission to leave. But it is not enough. We need Shishim Rivo, twice as much. So I told, see, Colonel, you have to permit every Jew leave Soviet Russia. Otherwise, your empire will collapse. You know, it was uh, uh, rather courageous, for I was still in uh, his hands. I was still uh, uh, under his arrest. But he told me something very, 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 very different. He told me, you know, we could never believe that you people are that courageous. And I translated it to myself differently. Before my arrest, I taught my students in the underground Ulpan the famous proverb, Ein davar haomed bifnei aratzon. Nothing can withstand the strong will. But uh, take attention, haratzon means a specific ratzon. Not everybody's ratzon. Whose haratzon is? The ratzon of Ribbon Shalom. Ribbon Shalom would ask to be good Eden, to be true, so I'm Israel, towards Israel, it's Israel. And the moment we are true, there is nothing that can withstand us. Even this superpower try to keep I'm Israel inside, he got broken, and I'm Israel, it's a bit beyond drama. By the way, another small or big miracle happened to me when arriving directly from Moscow to Vienna. For that time, there was still, it was 1981, there was no direct flights uh, to Israel. In Vienna I was uh, met by uh, the ambassador of Israel and all prominent uh, uh, people of the community brought to the, um, uh, to the embassy and then I called uh, oh, Menachem Begin, the Cholim Lebrocha uh, called me and I, I talked to my sisters I was excited and then he asked me what would you like to have like uh, use your first will you know, uh, if uh, somebody is put to death, he has a force, the last will, and if somebody is released, suddenly he need a bottle of vodka or whatever. I told, you know, now it's uh, Sunshkia, and for 11 years I wouldn't have a uh, film. So I would like to, to have film. 
the guy, the ambassador, looked around. It was real. I believe the head feeling, but not uh, close at hand. All of a sudden, an American uh, rabbi uh, stepped forward. It was Israel Zinger, that was at the time uh, uh, director executive of World Jewish Congress. <coughs> and Mr. Uh, Edgar Brofman, Allah Sholom, was instrumental in my release. He negotiated with the Russians my release, and it is how I became free. So Edgar Brofman sent Israel Rabbi Singer to see me being released. And Israel Singer told me, you know what? Before coming to see you, I called the Rebbe, Lubavitch Rebbe, and told, I am going to see Mendelevich released from the prison. What to bring God to Mendelevich? And the Rebbe told, bring him Tfilin. So is the Tfilin that uh, the Rebbe told me. You know, I'm not a Lubavitch, but it's a, a real miracle. How he couldn't know. And then later on, I was uh, uh, on the past June in summer in Moscow, invited by, by a very famous uh, tzaddik, so-called tzaddik from Leningrad, uh, Rav uh, uh, Itzhak Kogan, that was the first shoichet in the Soviet Russia in the 70s. He himself was a doctor in uh, 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 nuclear submarines. But then he discovered that there is a pro problem with the shechite, and he, being uh, enough skillful, better than uh, dealing with submarines, he started dealing with shechite. And the Rebbe sent a special uh, uh, shaliach to see whether the shechite is kosher. And he checked everything. It was 100%. So the shaliach told, I will tell the Rebbe, he will bless you for, the, for this big deed. And then it was the time of my hunger strike. Yitzchak told Rebbe, let, let the Rebbe bless yourself, Mendelevich. He is now under uh, hard condition. He is on a hunger strike, starving. Let the Rebbe bless that Mendelevich stop and uh, achieve whatever he wanted during his hunger strike and get released. And it's how it happened. So Yitzchak Kogan, the tragic of Leningrad, gave his broche to me. Unbelievable. So I told you know what? Yitzchak. You can't give a brocha samazoi. It's, we share now the same brocha. And it serves, you know. Uh, brocha, I got a brocha of um, Arab Moshe Feinstein. I uh, got a brocha of Arab Shach. And I uh, got a brocha of uh, Lubavitch. And so it's how, you know, Baruch Hashem uh, coming uh, back to my home. Everything with all the problems and all the hardships in Eretz Israel. I'm the most... Uh, uh, succeeding uh, man in universal because of uh, the best way as you know uh, the God loves people that keep Shabbos it's, uh, it's written so I try to do it the best I know that sometimes I'm not doing well but uh, please please uh, try to be strong try to remember me being there in a cell and praying for hours and asking Ribbono Shalom, Anna Hashem Moshiyana. And then Ribbono Shalom heard my prayer. It is everything is real. It is not only in the books, it is in, in, in our life. Thank you. Maybe some questions. Yeah, hey, yeah. Um, are there any questions for the rabbi? Some questions, please. You know, um, I will answer in beforehand the, the main question that normally people ask, or I assume that some people were not here yesterday, and the question uh, used, used to be, you know, knowing that we were arrested, certainly somebody uh, informed the KGB about our preparation. People ask, uh, you know who, uh, uh, who leaked out the knowledge, and you can suspect this and this one. I say he was really a Yahweh, the man that disclosed us, was, uh, made the best service for us. For the moment we were, if we would manage to hijack an airplane, we would be simply hijackers, you know. Nothing uh, proudly in it. But the moment we were arrested, we became the victims of Soviet regime. And now you people here got the case to fight for, for us and for others. So sometimes, you know, it looks bad, you know, but uh, as, I, as I put it before, uh, if you consider it really in terms of uh, our Ramuna, 
not everything bad is really bad. Uh, most important is the consequences. And because of his leaking out and informing, we were arrested and then the struggle started and Army Israel got released from the uh, Soviet uh, Empire and Soviet Empire crashed down. So, you know, if we, uh, you know the man, tell me, I will award him and the biggest uh, prize. So it's my question and my answer, but maybe you have, you are specific questions. Rabbi? Yeah. When you came to Israel, what would, after 81, and, and what you saw there, how did that, how, what, what, what you what received and how did you, what you were feeling based on what you imagined versus what you saw? You know, uh, uh, my privilege is that uh, I have a very uh, limited imagination. I never imagined, you know. My, uh, my effort to go to Eretz Israel was not to come to, come to a paradise and enjoy good life. I simply felt uh, isolated from Am Israel being in Soviet Russia. And my will was to become back a part and go through whatever Am Israel would go to join them. So it is no disillusion. It is exactly it, you know. Sometimes it's not that easy for to be involved in real life. Sometimes it means politics and politics things, you know. But teaching Torah and uh, studying Torah is a real involvement, you know. So no disillusion. I, I, you know, I am very critical about what is going on in Eretz Israel, but it's a critic of love, of compassion, of uh, you know, trying to do better. But sure, it's the best place in my life, and even being here in the Silver Spring, in a beautiful community with beautiful friends, I, you know, I felt bad, you know, for I uh, already ran away from the Golos, and each time it's uh, difficult to come back here. You, know? you go back to. to I years. visit Russia specifically, you know. I felt bad, but uh, there are still a million of Jews in Soviet Russia, <laughs> and they are far away, heavily assimilated. And I try to, re to try to reach and to talk to them. And I have, you know what, a Facebook. I have uh, 5,000 members in my Facebook. And once, you know, only for good reasons, you know, I publish all kinds of uh, lessons or whatever. And only recently I wrote in my Facebook that uh, I'm that excited and glad after 36 days, 60 years being in Eretz Royal. Walking out in the street, I felt the best privilege. And you know what? I got some 300 likes. People <laughs> like it, you know. It means Russian people. I wrote in, in Russian language. It means it's our common feeling, you know. Each time when I give a drosha and a shoe or whatever, maybe I can gather some 80 likes, 100. But this time it's overcrowded, you know. Everybody enjoy being uh, there. It means all hardships, it means all critics. Uh, but still, it is, uh, it's our place. Thank you. Yeah, please. Um, you mentioned that when you were about eight or nine, your father was in prison, and then your mother passed away, and you had two sisters. Who took care of all of you, and who fed you? There, you had nothing. Yeah, yeah. There no, were good, good eaten were around. And um, as a matter of fact, you know, uh, really, it was bad. Uh, for some time, my mother still functioned, so she took care. And later on, I had I have two sisters, who was older than me. The oldest was was that time 14 years old. So she became the head of the family. Never. Money. Money. The Jews would give money, you know. In the, every place, the less problem, the money, you know. The, uh, passion, the help, and then there was really an uh, outstanding man, uh, Moshe Ben Abraham. They came uh, to our uh, apartment and told us, I heard that you have problems. How can I help you? So for him to help, that would mean money. For him, put simply money, a lot of money on the table. Uh, help me meant to take out uh, my father out from the prison. So I arranged a lawyer and paid well, mm. and uh, mm. they admitted that my father is not guilty and he was released. So it's like 
Am Israel, Arabim Zebaze. The support in every place, even in Soviet Russia, a Jew tried to help another fellow Jew. And this is how it happened. Thank you. Yeah. Are some of the most significant impacts that the Six-Day War had on your journey and learning mm. about the Six-Day War in 1967? So I know that um, it has a biggest influence on everybody, in specific uh, for Soviet Jewry, for also people who know that there is, uh, in Soviet Russia, people who know that there is a, a Jewish state. But you know, there is a, like a, to know and not to know. You have to get an inner knowledge. And when it happened in 67, all of a sudden, a lot of Jews in Soviet Russia discovered that they have a country that can be proud of. And it certainly also, I became a part of our underground movement a year before, but I could evidence that then a, major, a lot of Jews joined our movement. People started uh, studying Hebrew, studying Jewish history. So it was a part of the revival, of the miracle revival of Soviet Jewry. And uh, uh, our dream, when we fought and we, got, uh, uh, we went to the airport, was to join our nation in Israel to continue the miracle of Six Day War. So it's a measure of influence. And by the way, I was told that uh, by people that were involved here in America in the struggle for Soviet Jewry, that uh, uh, it would say that's true that the Six Day War was important, but it, it was far away. What was important for us, the struggle for Soviet Jewry. It was our, uh, our war, it was a continuation of our war, of our Six Day War. So it is uh, not a historical development far away in the Middle East. The moment it happened, it, uh, it influenced everybody. And, uh, uh, you know, people say, mm, people say, okay, now, that time, it was really very important. A lot of people, and I met here, friends that were involved uh, heavily in the struggle for Soviet Jewry. Now, it doesn't exist. What else we can do? So, that it's obvious, but uh, the, the, the answer is very obvious, you know. Uh, Israel is still in danger, and we have to support it in many ways. I don't speak in money, for I'm not fundraiser, but uh, you know, to go there, uh, to uh, uh, help, to uh, sympathize, to support here in the Senate, in the Congress, uh, uh, the, the case. It's very important, you know, uh, once uh, being already released, I went to see a certain senator, maybe Bob knows whom I met. Anyway, I thanked him for whatever he did for Soviet Jewry and he's doing, it was 81, 82. He told me, you know, it is a simple secret. I am getting mail and here are the uh, letters being sent on specific issues. The moment I see that the sack with the mail on, on uh, Russian Jewry is the biggest part, I understand this is my, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> my task to do. So send emails, send letters, and I uh, believe uh, that even it, a small thing, uh, have an influence and uh, make other people, you know, there is a lot of things to do. And to begin with, you know, uh, this book um, of um, uh, uh, Unbroken Spirit was published uh, by American Jew Jews in Chicago. Uh, the moment they heard my speech and uh, telling the story, they decided to publish the book telling the book can help save American Jewry. So it turned out that you helped me and this being saved, you helped Soviet Jewry being uh, saved from Russian slavery. And now I, in my book, and you as well, is the uh, uh, most important uh, task to save as much as possible here in America. Uh, use my book, use uh, more, uh, for you know that uh, nowadays 70% of uh, uh, young population is uh, getting assimilated, intermarried, being lost. So it's not that we are missing a uh, task. There is a lot of challenges, a lot of tasks. Just look around and remember, if we are going and do it in Hashem Hashem, Lishem Shamayim, it will succeed. Thank you. Yes? So you've spoken a lot about your Amunah while you were in prison, but what exactly sparked that? 
And I said, what makes you start to be in Hashem? I described you a step-by-step -step development. Remember, I went to the cemetery. I discovered that, that uh, uh, people are even being dead alive. And then I went to a synagogue. I felt uh, that it is uh, uh, a privilege being a Jew. And then I decided to make myself an observing Jew when before being drafted to Russian army. So it's step-by-step -step development. The spark is uh, a very simple spark. You know, it is a pin to lead that every Jew has in it. So just the question is how to open it. So it was uh, all the developments uh, helped me. And in each, uh, in everybody's life, it's another way. But uh, we know that, as we say, neshama shinatata bi tarahi. Ibnu Shalam give us the spark it is inside. And it is a question of awareness. We have to think, to evaluate, and to be glad that we have the spark. That much that I can tell you. Yeah. 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 I'd like to ask you a question. I uh, sort of lived through um, Soviet Jewry struggle. What do you want, what do you think is the, our young people, they're all leaving, but what is the message you would like to leave with them in, um, about this? They're not, I don't think, aware of what you, you know, you're, you told your story, but they're not, fully aware of, of the years that went on in the Soviet Union. What is the message you want the teachers, the uh, children, uh, the young people, I should say, to know? What, what, uh... It's very simple, you say, uh, in two parts. To begin with, the best uh, thing in, uh, in a life is being a Jewish. It's the best joy in life being Jewish, you know. Not to be Jewish is bad. So enjoy being Jewish and try to build a new Jewishness. It is, my story is telling how a man from being like an ugly duck, something uh, a regular, a Soviet citizen, all of a sudden became a fighter, a struggler, even a preacher, you know, just because of it. That I discovered this Jewish soul. And then, uh, not less important, is that uh, uh, when we are united in America, in Israel, worldwide, we are the biggest uh, superpower. And we have to remember that uh, uh, as a consequence of our struggle, uh, not only the Jews got the permission to emigrate, it's the Russia that broke down. For it was the heaviest pressure on Soviet Union. They had all kinds of uh, cases, you know. But it was a real human case. You cannot interfere in the business of Soviet Union telling, make it more democratic. It's their business. But when you say, let the people go to their homeland, you cannot, you know, discuss it. So finally, they had to open. And when I mentioned that uh, after 11 years, some 300,000 Jews got permission to leave, it means 300,000 Jews would send letters and parcels to a talk called a telephone to a, a Soviet Russia. And people discovered that there is another world. We were altogether isolated. We didn't uh, know anything about you. We felt that our dull life is the life that you have. And all of a sudden, thanks to uh, this immigration that started, people discovered that there is a, li a real life. And it fueled them and gave the energy to demand and uh, to press up in Soviet government. And it is how it got down. So when people say that they celebrate um, the Berlin Wall being bro broken down, it's because of the Western Wall. It's what it goes wrong. Thank you. One more question. Okay. You mentioned the rabbi Israel Singer. Yeah. Do you know where he was from in Brooklyn? He is uh, from New Jersey. Oh, from New Jersey. I met him recently. He happened to have been married by a rabbi Maybe, you know, I, when uh, I, I come to talk to his daughter uh, uh, Bess Yaakov school, and uh, next day he took all his family that they should listen to uh, you know, something big that he did in his life. <laughs> Thank you. Now I invite you. We have some books still left. Uh, Thank you for uh, accepting me. I enjoyed being with you.